In this episode, we'll be talking about why is everybody talking about storytelling these days? We'll also address how stories can help you understand the world around us and help to co-create new services. And finally, we'll talk about activism and activists and why you need to become one. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hello, I'm Mary Alice Arthur, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to do more work that makes you proud by designing and delivering services that have a positive impact on people and are good for business. My guest in this episode is Mary Alice Arthur. Mary Alice helps people and organizations find stories that make them flourish and helps these stories to come alive. If you've been following the show for some time, you know that I think stories and storytelling are a key cornerstone in service design. And Mary Alice has a great way of explaining the power of stories and also how we can actually practically use stories on a day-to-day -day basis to do good. So this is an essential episode for any service designer. If this is your first time here on this channel, don't forget to subscribe and click that bell icon because I post new videos on this channel at least once a week. So that's all for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the interview with Mary Alice. Welcome to the show, Mary Alice. Thanks. Good to be here. Uh, it's really, it's really nice to have a non-service designer on the service design show uh, <laughs> because it's always so enriching to hear stories, and we're going to talk about stories from other fields. So I'm really happy uh, that you're here. For the people who don't know who you are, because probably this is a new audience listening to you uh, today, could you give a brief introduction? Who are you? I call myself a story activist, and that really has two parts. So I'm somebody who's really interested in how story works. And story, of course, is you could call it the human operating system. So it's a really good thing to know something about. And the word activist for me means what stories do I choose to pay attention to? Because when I activate stories, they come to life and we are living in stories. So it's really an interesting thing to know how to activate stories, which ones do we want to live in and which ones don't we want to live in. So that's one side of my work. I work with stories and how they're working. And the other bit is about hosting. So how do we actually work together well to bring our stories to life? And that is what kind of processes do we use? How do we host a conversation that really matters? How do we stay together when it gets hard? And how do we learn how to weave our stories together? I, I, I've i said in a previous episode that I believe that storytelling is really an important part of the work we do mm -hmm. as, as a service design community because it's all about communication and explaining and yeah. um, getting getting people to work together so uh, i'm sure that we'll learn a lot today you gave me three really interesting topics are you ready to start and do some interview jazz yeah <laughs> <laughs> let's this go. is new for me but yeah let's uh, yeah do let's 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 give it a shot okay so <clears throat> the first topic for today is called the new black the new black <laughs> And people are probably going like, starting. Can you show why, it up? why is why are we talking about storytelling as the new black? What does that <clears throat> mean? And so this is a phrase that comes out of the fashion industry, right? Mm. Black is the traditional color people wear in urban settings. And if you have ever watched a fashion event, so guys, don't worry if you haven't. But if you've ever watched a fashion event, there's lots of color, there's lots of movement, there's lots of clothes, and then the designer comes out and they're always wearing black. It's very interesting. They're very plain. So every so often the fashion industry says navy is the new black or maroon is the new black. In fact, in the U.S. there's a TV show called Orange is the New Black, a story exactly. of a woman who went to prison, right? <laughs> yeah. so, but I call story the new black because we are calling everybody a storyteller, which is actually factually true. If you are a human being, you are a storyteller. But we call our music 
people storytellers. We call our authors storytellers. That's more kind of a legitimate one. Sometimes we call our politicians storytellers. So we're, we're kind of labeling everything story. So story is like out there floating around, but not everybody knows how to work with it or what it really means. And why, you know, the first question is, is there a big difference in the attention for stories and storytelling for, let's say, in the last five or 10 years from your experience? And where is that coming from? That's the second question. If we look at the history, this is an interesting thing. There is a book out there called Megatrends that was written in 1983 by John Nesbitt and Patricia Aberdeen. And they were their trend, uh, future trend people. And they had written about these things that were coming up. The only one I remember out of that book was called High T Tech, High Touch. So it was interesting that in the 70s was the rise of personal computers. That's when Steve Jobs and his mates and others started working on everybody should be able to have a computer. And at the same time, the storytelling revival started to happen in the U.S. and the U.K. So suddenly people used, thought it was kind of interesting to get together and listen to traditional tales and tell personal stories and things like that. So these two things don't appear to be related, but they, in my book and from this particular future trend, I think they are. And if you look at social media, social media these days is a massive platform for personal storytelling. So... It was about 2003, you've had Annette Simmons on your, your show, yeah. I met her around that time, because the first people talking about organizational storytelling started meeting about that time. That's around also 2003, when, so 2003. like 50, 15 years ago, yeah. Yeah, that's also when IBM started, it had the Kenevan Center, Dave Snowden's work out of that, uh, started in IBM and their interest in story started then, that's when he was also working. So a lot of people started talking about it then, but I used to talk about it as a, a fresh green field and there were people outstanding in it. And I mean, there were people standing way over there. <laughs> and when I started talking about storytelling in 2003, 2004, people looked at me like I was crazy and they would say, oh, that's interesting. And then I could see them turn the other way. And then it finally started coming into the literature, probably when Steve Denning started writing about it. He had been working for the World Bank and because of that organization and the seriousness of that organization, suddenly the mainstream media, Harvard Business Review, started thinking about it. You know, when something goes into Harvard Business Review, it's kind of getting We've mainstream. had the same with design thinking and service design happen. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you and yeah. you, our practice fields would probably say, is it a good thing or not that people are all talking about this? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Maybe. Yeah, that, that's also, there was the conversation also with Annette, that sort of like, what is the downside that storytelling yeah. is getting the attention it is getting uh one thing that triggers me immediately like you said uh if you think about the new black and think about fat the fashion industry um it's it's you know it's fashion but i i wouldn't i don't know would you compare storytelling to fashion will it will it move into a new season and will storytelling be over probably not right but this is the challenge, I think, which is why I'm very interested in it, is because what happens when we begin to use things that are intrinsically part of our humanity as tools? And in the working world, we call that flavor of the month. You know, oh, I like this ice cream this month, and next, I, next month I'm onto something else. And we know about that in organizational settings. People get, they were into agile, and then they get into lean, and then they get into, so whatever the next thing is, gets the focus and then they kind of go, oh, well, that didn't work, let's use the next thing. But because stories are the way that humanity works in the world and, and takes its agency, the ability to do something, then I think it's really important to say this is more than a tool. And what does that mean? So do we, what do we have to do to make, it won't blow over because like you said, it's part of humanity. So, mm -hmm. um, should we treat it in a different way? Should we have a different conversation around it? What? I think so. I think people need to say, how do I become the most conscious about how story works? Uh, when, I, when I decided to take on the, the title story activist, I had one friend who, who had very early on in the 1960s been working with the farm workers movement. And she said, don't use this word activist, you know, people respond negatively to it. And I thought to myself, there are so many words I can think of that need reclaiming. And activism is one of them, and leadership is one of them, and power is one of them. All of these things, consumer, you know, like we, we call people consumers, but 
what would happen if we believed ourselves to be citizens? You know, like the languaging is actually really important. How we define things. And so we're in that period when things need reframing, renaming, reclaiming. These mm. all rhyme interestingly mm. enough. I didn't mean to do that. But <laughs> we, we need to do some of that activity to say, what does it really mean? Instead of this flyby. So we have a political leader who talks about fake news and alternative facts, which is very interesting because it actually puts the focus on what does real mean and what are we using our stories for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, you know, kind of like when, when will we wake up to how we're using our stories really? And that's and, part of the work I've been doing. Can we create some consciousness around story? And more consciousness. So how, how would you describe the way we're using stories these days? I think about it as three waves. So and, uh, yeah, and they're yeah. kind, of, kind of like waves rolling in. But the, the biggest one right now is influence. So we are in the wave of influence. And people, especially organizational leaders, want to learn how to tell stories because they want influence. They want to say, listen to my idea or... Um, you should, you should trust me on this or buy my product or here's, you know, our product means this, so we're going to tell some stories about it. So by far, I think what's making this incredible rise of storytelling is the wave of influence. People believing I want influence. The oh. question, of course, is what are you using your influence for? For good or for evil. <laughs> yeah, because a bulldozer is simply a tool. It can knock down something precious, yeah, or it yeah. can make the way for something to be built. It all depends on how you decide to use it. So a story is the same. Hmm. I would say there are no innocent stories. Every story is asking for As something. an agenda, yeah. Yeah, and maybe yeah. the agenda is just, Mommy, will you listen to me? Hmm. I want to tell you. You know, or, or I'm, I feel hurt and I want somebody to, be, to, to, to know how I feel or this happened and I can finally express it. All of those stories are asking for something. Will, will you be sharing the other two waves in uh, yes. the, the next topics? Okay, so th- this is a good time to sort of move, move forward. <laughs> Let's move on into the second topic. And I think uh, this will give you the opportunity to talk about the other waves. And the second topic is called Story Rolls. Mm-hmm. So before I get into those, I want to. I do want to talk about the other two topics yeah. before I get into the story roles. Yeah. Okay. So the f- important thing to know is this word here: story, story field. field. So we think about ourselves and about things as having a story, but in fact, we are the intersection of all the stories that we hold about ourselves, all the stories we others hold about us, all the stories of our roles. Like you're a you're a uh, somebody who works in service design. You're a father. You're a colleague. You're a friend. You're a you might be a sibling. Maybe you have others. You're a son. All of those things are different stories, and so you're actually not one story. You are you are a field. And it's an interesting thing to know that every person, place, or thing is a field. So every organizational structure, every product is the intersection of all these different stories. And that makes it interesting. And of course, the question is, which stories are on top? Exactly. And what's playing itself out? Mm, mm, mm. So the first wave of story, I think, is about influence. The second one is about collective sense and meaning making. We can work with stories because they have the gold in them. Because we tend to file all of our experiences and what we know in our heads in story form. That means we can find out what we know by asking for the stories. So context equals content. And a good way to get stories from people is to ask a good question. That's what we try to do here. (laughs) Yeah. And that is, in fact, one of the most powerful tools, I think, for leadership is the ability to ask questions, and I call it question literacy. We think of literacy as the ability to read, but there's also question literacy, the ability to ask good questions. And not many people have that these days. Very interesting. So that's the second wave. So tons of people know about story for influence. Fewer people know about story for collective sense and meaning making. The third one, I think, is healing and holding. That is holding, W-H-O-L-I-N-G, bringing the pieces back together. How can story help us come together around things that we've maybe been fragmented around? Mm. And I often think when I'm working with groups, whether people realize this or not, that there is some healing needed before you can get into action. So whether that's 
uh, I'm sorry I didn't tell you, or I'm sorry you didn't know that, or I need to apologize for this, or I see you now, or any of those kind of things. It's either very covert, meaning people are aware of it, or overt, people are aware of it, or it's covert. Something needs to happen in order for people to step in fully. Mm. So mm. very few people know about that one. But that leads us into the roles. So yeah, how can I'll, I'll you... hold it up once again. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, there we go. Story the story roles. roles. So this... Here's my question in return. What if story could really help you in a variety of ways that you're working? What are some roles you could take on, right? Mm. So the first one for me, when I think about field work, that is, how do I find out the story field I'm working in? Then I need to take on the role of expedition leader. And the nice thing about this word expedition is that an expedition leader realizes they need a variety of talents on their team in order to find out what's really going on. So that also means we need a variety of stories in order to find out what's really going on. So how can we use story to help us explore the territory we're working in? So that's one role. Secondly, stories can help you develop stuff. I want to take my work further. I want to um, find out how service design can extend through the products and places I'm working. So this is a strategic approach. So this is a strategist role. It's a strategic thing to use stories to help develop what you're doing. So what stories are we going to tell about something? or what can, So we first of all are going to learn about the field that we're in. And now we're going to go, okay, well, strategically, which stories should we be telling in order to take our work further? So which stories do we put on top? Is that, yeah? Yeah. Which yeah. Do, we, do we lift up? Exactly. Hey, look at this. Which stories do we help to emerge? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we can help them by, by uh, keeping using them. Then there's this role of harvesting. So I use this word harvest. At, we know about what harvesting is if we know about farming. So every farmer plants for a harvest. You have a plan. So if you want to be a good harvester, this is about finding out what stories we're carrying. And it's a really interesting thing to, to harvest the story of our project team around service design. What have we learned working on our work? that may take us forward or show us where innovations are waiting or help us to understand who was there that we didn't see at the time. So harvesting is a really interesting way to use stories. And, and how does harvesting relate to the first one, like uh, exploring which, sto which stories are around? How, how do, do these two relate? So here I want to search out what's, what's the field I'm operating in. You know, what's, yeah. what are, where, where are these intersecting stories? What are people saying about something? What are they, and usually the stories they're telling are telling me what they believe about it. So what do people believe? Now I might go, I really want to go after, I have a specific harvesting tactic I want to take. I want to go after who uh, needs to work with whom to make this thing really work well. So I'm going to ask that as my question and go after stories that will help me to find out about mm, that. Mm. This is like a research perspective. Mm. And then finally, this one is about co-creating. If I want to take on the role of a visionary, then my, I can create a story, a future story, to say where are we going to go in the future? Because we, the story is like the roadway. It takes us in a certain direction. So together with what I'm working on or who I'm working with or whoever my, my uh, co-creators are, we can become visionary and decide where we're going by creating stories that could take us there. And, and this last uh, thing immediately reminds me of politics like the, the, in yeah. which story of which story do you want to be part of like is is yeah do you agree like is is that uh, yeah politicians are always doing that and you'll notice the wave we've been in this wave right at the moment with things seem to be going a bit more right and most of our politicians are saying we're going to make us great again <laughs> That's, that's not only here, yeah, but that's yeah, in yeah, other places yeah. too. Uh, returning to the good days, returning to the old days. Ret what that story is telling us is I want to take us back to a place of comfort where we felt we knew what we were doing and who we were. The interesting thing for me is could they decide to do this instead and say, who do we decide to be? That's actually a much more interesting jumping off place from my perspective. Hmm. If hmm. we knew where we were, and said, oh, so we, we can, you know, if we knew where we were at this moment, then who do we decide to be? How, how, do we, how have we learned to work together? And then who do we decide to be as a result? Could be really interesting. I don't notice politics moving in that direction. It yeah. tends to be more 
populace. But for those of us who are voting, we could say, what stories are people telling? And if I dig into those deeply, why are they telling those? And do I, therefore, really want to go in that direction with that person? Or what story mm. do I choose? Mm. If I wake up, get beyond the emotion. Stories trigger emotion, which is why they're really powerful. Which, which of these four roles it, um, it, is a role that you find most interesting or most valuable or most, yeah, interesting, valuable? I can tell do you which one I think is the do, <laughs> do I have a preference? I like doing all of those things. But I can I'm, imagine. I'm, in general, I like doing this a lot because this is the unsung role. Yeah. What do we really already know from what we've experienced? If we would go after where have we learned to work well together? Or if, if I'm thinking about a product or a service, when has it happened that people are interacting with this at the very, the, the very level we hope for? And what helped that to be true? So if we really dig into what we are, what's already hiding in plain sight, that's <laughs> something, there's something really, it's, really it's, cool about that. I, I, I'm thinking about the harvesting perspective as uh, just sort of tuning in to the, the stories you want to hear or see, because like you said, yeah. it's a story field and sort of you hear all the stories at the same time, but harvesting is like tuning in to those specific yeah. stories you're interested in. Like it's you, like you tu only tuning want to a radio station. You only want to listen to the violins and not the rest of it's something like that, not 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 the rest of the yeah. orchestra. Yeah. Hmm. And um from your experience, which role is the most challenging or hard? Sometimes it can be this one. The and that's visionary because role. Yeah. The co the co creating because hmm. often people come to work on something with certain ideas. I want it to be like this, or here's where the potential is, or, you know, so, it, and we can even be using the same language and mean quite different things. Mm -hmm. and, and it may take us a long case, time to realize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you have to sort of establish first a common language before you can even start to Yeah, and I've think worked about with this. some senior teams who realized later they were using the same word for different stuff and that's mm. why they could never understand each other <laughs> oh you mean that oh and now i get it and yeah and i think language is so important and that's one of the big struggles in service design that everybody if the running joke is if if you ask 10 service designers for a definition of the field you'll get 11 definitions and that's that's yeah. a, that's really a language issue right we don't have a con our language is not common enough um, i'd say yeah yeah you so wanted to add something it, yeah that's that that can make it really interesting to ask them to tell a story instead of a give a definition yeah and that's probably and that's usually what happens exchanging what i call yeah. war stories or st yeah, that, that's yeah tell me what you yeah. did and how it went down yeah yeah. I, are you ready uh, to move on to the third topic? And I think it closely relates to what you started with. Yeah? yeah. Okay. I am. You, you said you call yourself uh, an activist. So here we go. Activist. And the question for you again to come up with an interesting question starter. Yeah. How far can we take story? And how, how far can we work with it? And that's why I think this whole concept of story activism or being a story activist is really interesting because essentially all of us are story activists. And I got this phrase from a New Zealand actor called Cliff Curtis. And he was recorded as saying something like, uh, when story is really working, it makes you want to do something. It makes you want to run, to jump, to be active which is, of course, the essence of story. Uh, and so everybody who works with story for me is an activist, something like that. And I just po poked my ears up like this, it perked my ears up to say, oh, I'm a story activist, that's what I want to do. So the question is, what stories are we paying attention to and how? So within any story field, there are some stories that we need to stop telling. When we keep telling those stories, it's not helpful. So I noticed that in the uh, NGO field, a lot of, a lot of nonprofits 
uh, especially working with people who are marginalized, use very deficit language, and they have to tell victim stories a lot in order to get funding. But what does that force the people who hold those stories? It forces them to stay victims, essentially, because mm. they have to mm -hmm. keep telling mm -hmm. the story to get the money. So some stories need to stop being told. Some stories we need to keep telling because they're really good. And some we need to start telling. And it's interesting in this field to ask yourself, what stories need to stop being told? What stories do we need to keep telling? And what stories do we need to start telling? And, and that's like writing a new chapter for your book. Yeah. Like what, what will the ne next chapter look like? What do you want to be you, mm. the next chapter? And you ask the question, how far can we take stories or... What do you mean with how far? How far in, in terms of? So do you think about story as a tool? Do you think about story as a methodology? We've talked about it as, as something that can inform some roles that work inside of, inside of the work. Um, is it a way of life? Uh, so I often, when people say to me, what is story really? I, I have a number of pictures I hold up. So I hold up a, a picture of a road leaning into the future. So it, a story can take us into the future. It's a frame. So often people can't, you know, they have, they, whatever their, their picture is, like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever this is, it's like having a, a, a box of puzzle pieces that have been put together. I've got my tidy picture, but then suddenly another piece comes in. Where does that go? It's outside the frame. Oh. So it can be a restriction or it, it focuses the way we look at things. Uh, sometimes I show people a picture of a, a bowl of yogurt because story is a live culture <laughs> and and it's continually being fed so what are you feeding it if you feed it negative things it becomes negative if you feed it positive things it becomes positive but it's alive and i always say to people if yogurt isn't alive don't eat it it's not any good for you and sometimes i show people a picture of my suitcase because sometimes our stories are baggage mm. They keep dragging behind us and we somehow are carrying this weight. So it, story is all of those things. And it's really, you know, how far am I willing to dig in to see how it can be helpful to me and where I decide to take it and who I can become because of it. Yeah, so this is super inspiring for me because I think no thinking about stories in these different um let, I, I'll, I'll call them applications, uh, yeah. enables you sort of to think how, in, in which places, in which situations will I use stories and in which way. Uh, I sometimes tell about that we use stories to sort of uh, communicate results. Uh, we use stories to do research. We use stories yeah. to get people uh, engaged. And it's like, it's all those things. It's not just, it's not just a way of communicating, like, right? And that's also what you're saying. Yes. There are, yeah. Yeah, you can do more with, with it. And that's how far are you in, interested to go? What's, I don't know if you thought about it, but what is the next frontier of stories, storytelling, stories? What's going to happen in the, in the next near future? Well, you know those three waves I talked about? Yeah. Are, and yeah. and I, 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 I don't have a big piece of research about them, but I have a little piece of research. Because I talked about those at a conference in 2017. And I wrote a blog post about influence and on LinkedIn and 4,000 people, more than 4,000 people read my blog. And I was like, whoa, I'm a blogger now. I felt really great. We'll link to the and blog then, somewhere down here. Yeah. Yeah. And then I wrote the second part about collective sense and meaning making. 800 people read that. And I, I was, a, I got a little bit sad, you know, kind of like well, what's happened to my big audience. And then I wrote about healing and holding and 200 people read that. And at first I was really depressed. And then I went, no, I'm right. <laughs> It was kind of proof that I'm right because, in fact, it's like that. Influence, collective sense of meaning, healing and holy. So I think we're in that part, we're, we're in that time in the planet right now where so many of us realize we've run out the end of our old story. We don't actually know who we are anymore together as a humanity. We don't, we've kind of, what is our purpose? Why are we here? We seem to be 
impacting the planet greatly and we don't seem to have the will to do something together about it. Why not? Uh, but we don't know what the next story is and, and so many of us are feeling um, uncomfortable, sad, or even incredibly depressed in our organizational structures. Many of us are wondering if family life is all that is or feeling incredibly stressed that we have so much to do around even keeping the basic stuff together. So we are at, one could say, a crisis of story. And maybe the, the interesting thing is, what do we choose to do with our story together? Because the truth is, there can't just be one story. There needs to be some frame within which all of these ways of looking at the world can, can fit and work and live together. Hmm. And what, what is that? I don't know exactly. But what, what's the story what's that connects coming. us? Yeah. Now and tomorrow. Yeah. Hmm. If, this if, doesn't yeah. seem to be the kind of thing politicians are focusing on at all, but it's, no, that, that, in yeah. it's, an, it's the most important question. If if people are interested in this topic and want to learn more about it, what would be some good resources that you could recommend? The project I'm doing right now is called Story the Future. And if you look at storythefuture.com, you'll find some of the ways we're trying to raise consciousness around what story does and, and how it works. And there's a growing group on Facebook, Story the Future Online Summit is the Facebook group. Um, there are some people out there doing some interesting writing on that, including Charles Eisenstein, who wrote um, The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know Is Possible. Um, David Corton, who has written stuff about what's the next story. Um, of course, Otto Scharmer's work is really kind of touching on the edge of that. There are many people who are kind of coming at it from different angles, which is why I started working on Story of the Future, because I said, where is that place where all of us doing this stuff could meet? because there is not really a cohesive practice field around it. So many, many people now more than ever, when I look at my, my history since 2003, of very few people now to almost everybody talking about story, mm. it's quite a different field. So <laughs> yeah. the biggest question is how can we work together? And let's hope uh, this community will also connect with the yeah. story thinkers community because i think we can collaborate and learn so much from each other yes. so um so. we're heading towards the end and i always have one final question and that is um <laughs> is there a question that you have for us for the viewers the listeners of the service design show is there anything you'd like us to chew up on Yeah, I think of service design, I think, in the kind of the most broadest possible way. And one thing that, you know, the built environment, I think, is a really, really interesting place to look. And I'm thinking that specifically, I came back to the U.S. after living overseas for 35 years, some large part of that in New Zealand, sometime in Europe. And the way that all of the services and how they're presented act on our psyche is really, really interesting. And the United States has a very particular service culture attitude, which I find phenomenally interesting, but also slightly stressful because it's, it's, it's kind of a wound up. It has to be operating all the time. So I begin to ask myself, is 24-7 actually healthy for us? Is everything on demand actually a healthy human thing? And how do we help people become very wise in their consuming choices. Maybe, yeah, maybe what, what is the price we're paying for enabling services Yes. in, in that sense, right? Yeah, yeah. And there's always a price, there's always a price. That's, that's a, what's a, maybe what's the trade-off? That's, that's, that's a better, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. that's a more positive way to, to formulate it. Um, I want to thank you for sharing what you are doing, sharing what, uh, sharing about stories and sh sharing your stories. I think I you inspired me at least to to learn and to dig more into this topic, and I'm sure uh, a lot of listeners and viewers too. So thank you, uh, Marielle. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's been really fun. My pleasure. How do you deal with the trade-off? of designing services, for instance, that have a high availability. 
How do you manage those trade-offs? Leave a comment down below and let's continue the conversation there. If you're interested in stories and storytelling and want to tell the story about service design, check out the free course that I've got for you that helps you to explain service design in plain English. And if you'd like to see more videos, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified when new videos are out. Thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.